This looks like a bush did no L to you all. Hold on. If y'all squish it together, I'll get my chocolate. I'll be the branch. Actually, guys, you all are just really, really fortunate to have these folks here because you've got the best of the best here. And I'm just really pleased to have uh, the opportunity to tell you who these guys are. Of course, you all know who mm -hmm. Lauren. So those of you who were here the first hour, who's the pastry chef here at Hotel Rona Conference Center. And then over here is one of our dear friends. He's a, he's a stepchild of our chapter. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. we love him to death. This is Jeff Blount, who is uh, the pastry and baking um, instructor and over the program at Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And if you walk in the doors downstairs when you come this afternoon, you're going to see some amazing chocolate sculptures. Amazing. And then on the other side of Lord, just bookends here, mm -hmm. John Shop, who is the pastry and baking instructor at Culinary Institute at Virginia Western Community College. And you've seen some of his work. If you watched the television this past week in the morning, you saw some of his work mm -hmm. and his students' work. Um, so we're happy to have him. And then we have Tom Hamelman, who is a um, secondary instructor at Jackson River Technical uh, School. And he has been, you were here at one time, weren't you, at Hotel Ronick? Yeah, sure. sure. uh, as uh, the executive chef here at sous the Hotel Ronick. Sous chef, okay, at the Hotel Ronick. So, so he was in charge. He has a lot right. of. Huh? <laughs> so he was in charge. charge. He, he was in charge. Was in charge. <laughs> so, yeah. And so he brings a wealth of experience in terms of the entire culinary world plus the, the baking. So you have the whole gamut here from all ages, and they are going to just answer any questions you might have and there were some good ones that people were telling me they needed to ask so I'm saying give these guys the questions so they're going to talk to you a little bit about some things that they know and want to share with you but then we're going to open it up for you folks to ask them questions good morning good everybody good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> anybody out of the gate have any questions let's, let's you got that one that you really you were like I'm going to forget this if I don't who out there bakes who out there bakes and sometimes things don't work out the way you want, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, any of those specific things that happen, your, uh, I don't know, maybe your cakes dome up in the middle or they fall and collapse or you're not sure why a cookie, one time they're nice and tight and the next time you do the same recipe they're spread all over the pan and touch each other. Any of that kind of stuff? You can answer all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's start with the cookie one. <laughs> well, oh, uh, the cookie one. I love the cookie one because we we do this at the, at our school all the time. It's, um, we we call it the infamous the, the creaming method. Um, so first off, uh, margarine and butter are not um, equal, uh, as much as my mom wants to think that they are. Um, <laughs> Mom, you have to buy the butter um, if the recipe says butter. Um, creaming method, um, it's, it's very specific. Um, I tell folks, um, especially if you're doing any baking at home or um, it's just a leisurely kind of fun day, um, baking with friends and family, which we, we tend to do um, around the holiday season. Um, usually the first thing that causes a cookie to either spread less or more is it's those first few steps is the butter nice and cold and chopped up into small pieces and creamed with the sugars for the right amount of time so that it's just fluffy but not over creamed. Were you on the phone with Aunt Sally a little bit longer? Did the kids go mom or dad? In my case, I get that one a lot. Um, Carson scuffed his knee and I have to quickly just t turn the mixer off and go handle whatever because if I if I let it keep going because you think to yourself, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's, I don't have everything in there yet. If it keeps going, you, in, you, you lose that emulsion. Um, the butter and the sugar working How together. How do you tell that it's been going too long? Um, <laughs> the candidate answer of experience? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 was, well, it, it looked the same. I was making a pound cake for Christmas, a, a cold oven pound cake. And cold oven pound cake. And uh, I don't know how long Here's the next question. I'll, and, and so I'll, 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 ask, I'll ask one of my questions. This is like my students when I get this one. So you made a cold oven pound cake. Did you make the recipe just one time? Or were you trying to double it? No, I made it once. 
Yeah. Okay, because I have one of these recipes that it's like, don't double it, ever. Yeah. And it even has, me, yeah, my mother told, and actually it was my grandmother's handwriting, don't try to double this recipe. Why? I went, you know why? So like, I'm like, I could do baker's percentages, I'll figure it out. I tried it. It honestly doesn't work. It honestly doesn't work. You got insights on that? Oh, I avoid the creaming method at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. My my chocolate my chocolate chip cookies I melt butter. My vanilla cake I uh, I I do the the method where you you put all the dry ingredients and then add add the soft butter and let it get sandy. Is there a name for that method? It's a modified it's a modified sponge method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and so. any other uh, yeah I just I just try not to do that. So is there kind of a time thing with it, like how long you cream it? Because well, I, I would have yeah. thought soft butter, and that's what I did. I used soft butter. And if it's too soft, then it it looks broken. That's yeah. always the phrase that I tell people. It's broken. I always, um, curdled. Yeah, it, curdled. Each of these things matter when you, you know, if you change a mixer, mixture or the amount that's in that specific mixture. So um, I would suggest once, you know, what you're looking for is just an even incorporation of that solid fat and sugar. And the more you're paddling that, the more air is incorporating into it, and that's going to contribute to spread. Mm. There's some other things that are contribute to spread that we'll probably what talk about. What does it do to the cake? If you're like my cold oven pound cake, what does it do? you know what it does to that? It'll cause it, if it overcreams, it'll actually souffle and then collapse. Okay. So it'll dome up. You'll be like, oh, wow, it looks beautiful. And then it's, And if you it's don't the big finale it, and then poof. <laughs> and you still have solid pieces of fat in there, then those kind of melt away and yeah. leave weird pockets and um, bits. So it kind of um, yeah, it's the will, will affect that. Yeah. And then you have preheated oven temperature, you know, and we're talking about a cookie, and you've just mixed that cookie, if you want to chill it to get that fat set again, um, if you don't, it'll tend to spread out and that fat will melt out, um, and it'll affect the texture of your cookie. Um, or <coughs> Similarly, if your oven's not preheated or you just kind of put them in and the oven's coming up, kind of same thing will happen. So once you, you get it together, then usually chill and, and go into that preheated oven. And then... I got usually, another odd one. It's a psychiatrist thing. I, it's, it's really interesting. So how bad of a mood are you in when you go into the bake shop? Uh, that's true. Um, when, we, when we scoop flour, most of us at home, we're not using a scale, we use cups. <coughs> so was it a, was, was it a bad morning? Did you, did you aggressively scoop in there and get, pack the flour in? Was it an easy morning and you kind of just, <laughs> less ingredients, more ingredients? I know it sounds really weird, but it, it's, it, but it all goes back to consistency. Every single bit of that goes back to consistency. And when we're in the industry, we scale everything off to make it more consistent. I mean, in my kitchen, everything's in grams. I took my grandmother's cheesecake recipe, which I really love, um, and I wanted to bring it to the table of the restaurant that I worked at at one time. And it was all in little packages and things that she made. So I, I made it that way one time and then put it into grams. So then I was able to multiply it so that I could make it for the 500 covers that we did a week. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted my grandmother's cheesecake recipe and I wanted to do it in individual portions. Just like, but she would make an eight inch spring form and I don't have time to make it the way she did it. Take the Pyrex dish and I, it was great that my grandmother wrote all those notes, but I, it's not her kitchen. So I had to get it to where I could get the ingredients and then go back and I think the consistency is the big thing. Um, doing things the same way every time and that's where I think a lot of folks. Yeah. What about environmental conditions? You, you make yeah. it in January Oops. or you make it in June or air conditioners on? Mm -hmm. And then flowers are different, different times of year. You may go to the grocery store and well that flower was on <coughs> sale. Let's talk about that a little bit. Flowers. What about age of flowers? Mm -hmm. I mean, how long is flour visible? Depends on the protein content yeah. of it. The more protein in it, the quicker it'll go. On yeah, it. it goes rancid. It'll have a smell to it. So you can tell those um, flours, the, the more protein that's in it, they'll tend to have a, um, I mean, that's what we use for, for bread 
spreads and your high gluten flours tend to be a little more not so snowy white. They have a little beigeish yellowish tint mm -hmm. to them. And um, your starchier flours that you use for your softer baked goods, pastry flour, cake flour, things like that, um, tend to have more starch content in them and tend to be a little more white. And um, you can squeeze them to check if you're just not sure. The high protein flours, when you squeeze them really tight, just kind of fall open and the softer cake flours cool. um, cake. So they're almost like a little snowball. So you can kind of tell if you ever mix them up. And, and the flour matters um, a lot in mm -hmm. anything good. Oh, yeah. So um, if you're trying to make bread at home and it's calling for bread flour or high gluten bread flour, or, you know, a combination of the two, and you just haven't had pastry flour there and you're trying to make that bread. The brand and salt will make a difference, too, don't you? The pardon? Brands. Mm -hmm. The brand of flour? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. And you get what you pay for. Yeah, <laughs> and even the you know the artists and bakers they're they're down into what field was that grain? Yeah, grain ash grain. content. Yeah, what time um, of year? Just like wines. <laughs> I mean, we're to that point where it's green or hard or soft wheat. Time of year. What's the ash content? What was the drying rate? When you're using butter and uh, creaming, is it a good idea to cool your uh, bowl and beaters. I just try to get everything to the right. I mean, like in my kitchen, it's, it's 72 degrees. The butter's not, but the, the machine is 72. And you don't put it in the fridge? Not, and not unless I'm turning from one recipe to another. I mean, if the kitchen's really warm that day, I can I can chill it down, or I'll put a, a ice water into the bowl, right. swirl it around, dump it back out, dry it, pat it dry, and go with it. We do that quite a bit with, with bread doughs, usually more than anything else, because yeah. if you're running a, a pizza dough or a bread dough and your final temperature of that dough needs to be 76 degrees so it doesn't move too fast on you, even putting ice cold water in the dough to start if it's going to mix for 10 minutes, that friction from the mixer. Yeah, the friction factor adds. Yeah. Friction, you know, we, I mean, bakers, we talk about friction factors and ingredient Temperatures. Desired dough temperature. Yeah, desired dough temperature. I mean, if you're one of those folks that is sitting on flour and you put it in the refrigerator, that can affect the mix, the mixing. Um, if you freeze ingredients because you're trying to hold them for a longer time, that can affect your, I mean, bakers in the industry, we, we hold eggs out at room 10. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and then the, the, the catch that goes over top of all that is, there is no this way all the time. It's responding to your environment that day. And um, I like the little esoteric, the, what kind of mood are you in? Yeah, um, at home, yeah. And there's I don't know if there's any um, there's somebody science in, on that, but I, I There's totally a kid at UNCC Charlotte that's doing a whole how you feel is how you cook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a I study that, that they're doing. And I think yeah. it totally well, translates through to the- Translates to actually- Some of your recipes require you to sift the flour before you measure it, mm -hmm. for that reason, uh, depends on the specific formula. And, and yeah, yeah I mean, typically we're wanting to um, sift stuff in. I don't, we don't sift. I don't sift bread flours. When no, we're bread. I never sift Typically, when we're doing a, 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 a cake or a muffin or a quick cakes bread, and muffins, like and that. we usually sift all the uh, leavening agents, the chemical leavening agents. But together. that also refers back to why professional bakers scale their ingredients. They yeah. don't use cup measures as often. They scale everything for consistent results. So when we're scaling, we're doing even, this. Yeah. So it's kind of already sifting into the right. scale as opposed to... And the moisture content yeah. of flowers can really affect Huge. the results. Um, if you're in a humid environment, um, you're going to you run the risk of different results. Or if you've been storing that flour for some period of time, you don't really consider the moisture content of flour, but it can affect it over Effect of the final product. Uh, if you really does, we just had this last week um, in intro um, baking lab. We did um, um, laminated dough puff pastry, and you know, scaled out the <coughs> recipe. And within a couple of revolutions of the, the mixer, it's like this looks a little bit dry. Um, and it was, and it took an extra about a half a cup, quarter cup, half a cup of water, um, large amount. You know, there's about I think, ten pounds of flour in there, so. Seems small, but it's 
it's one of those things that cold dry season. Yeah, it's cold dry season, so you know it's been pulling that humidity out of the flour in the in the bake shop, and you get all the humid dehumidifiers around. And do either of you have experience baking at high altitudes too, which <laughs> can definitely affect? Yeah, one time it didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> I try to avoid those. I stay close to home. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm a Flor I'm from Florida, so yeah, those guys from um, Denver aren't paid enough, if you ask me. Yeah, I baked in the Outer Banks, so. At one point, I remember standing at the oven um, at the Sanderling, and out my they had just built this new wing off the kitchen, and it was the it was actually the bake shop wing, so you could look out from my deck ovens where I was standing and loading focaccia and farm loaves. I could look out my left window, and just over the the first berm, the sand dune, I could see the ocean, and then the door swung open as the Cisco guy came in, and I could see the sound. Sounds really nice. <laughs> Think to yourself, one really good storm, <laughs> and this deck oven is going to float. Well, it was never the deck oven, but I did come into work one day when we got a pretty good storm, and the walk-in cooler outside was off. I wondered why there was these straps that were attached to the ground. <laughs> the the walk-in freezer cooler combo thing had just floated into Highway 12. Wow. But it's it's baking even at that level in comparison to Charlotte. Um, I didn't realize that Mexico City, I was in Mexico a month and a half, I didn't realize Mexico City is high altitude. And they warned me when I got into the kitchen, they were like, you're high altitude. And I'm like, it's Mexico City, what do you mean high altitude? Did anybody else think that Mexico City was? So Mexico City is actually like almost Denver. Wow, really? I didn't realize that, but they warned me and they, I would look at stuff and they go, so the temperature in the oven of course, it went through a translator to me, and they would tell me really quick, and they, so we, had, we adjusted it, and I went, I'm not going to try to wrap my hand around it, but I know it's different. Um, well, I and just, we had the same, I had the same experience at Snowshoe, um, spending a season up there, everything, regardless whether it was baking or on the culinary side, uh, you tended to burn everything. Um, the altitude <coughs> severely affects it, and I don't think so much in Roanoke, though, that we consider that. Um, what are we, about 1,300? Or something. And, uh, we burn stuff in the lab a lot. Yeah. So. I don't think that's high altitude, Chef. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be high altitude, Chef. <laughs> but that's, the creaming thing is interesting, too, because I have a couple of students here who would back me up. Um, we've identified one of the trickiest things for my program, um, which is to send a lot of kids, high school kids, um, give them what we consider bulletproof recipes and let them do that. But when you're talking about that creaming method, as bakers, you understand that these are formula and they're not recipes. Formula mean that you follow very specific guidelines and very specific steps. And I give a high school student the list of ingredients. By the way, our chocolate chip cookie recipe is the Nestle's Tall House multiplied by four. Um, but it's cool for those kids because they get, they scoop out 150 at a time and they feel like they're doing production. I guess technically they are. Yeah. But I can get them to read the ingredient list, no problem. It's those five sentences that come after that about how to do these things in the exact um, correct order. Um, and that's where people tend to skip over too fast and not really understand. Read the steps that you're getting ready to take, envision what you're getting ready to do, and then act on them. And here lately, since we switched from butter to margarine in our cookie recipe, the spread has not been as big a problem. Margarine's much more predictable. Oh, it's yeah, margarine that's more predictable. It is in our in this one case. Yeah. But butter has a couple of different things going on, and usually, yeah, the, it, it, there's a price point that goes with it. Um, so if we if we buy cheap butter, we, we get a lot of water in there, a lot of liquid. Right. And you know, the, the, the richer the butter, the more fat content we have, the less of that water content we have. I end up with a flatter cookie. With with the higher butter content, I end up with a flatter cookie. You do, yeah. Steam, oh. right? That's a leavening agent. There is steam is a leavening agent, so I end up with just a little more puff with still a good quality, but an eighty six as opposed to like a ninety two Palugra. You know, I won't let my students put the European Palugra butter in the chocolate chip recipe. Cook. Although it does taste really good, <laughs> but it has a little less. What did you just say? Uh, so there's a European butter. No, but I mean butter 
Okay, so there's American butter. Right. Here in the States, we have typically like an 84 to 86% butter fat content. Right. The remainder is solids and water. Um, and water is a leavening agent. It, it, when it gets to a certain temperature, it, it turns to steam and it causes things to rise. You'll yeah, end up with a little expand. puff, a little puff at the end of your cookie. It'll just puff up a little bit. And um, it, it leaves it a little crispy on the top middle surface. It's kind of what, when you first pull the cookie out, it's like puffy in the top. Right. And then when you sometimes slide it off the cookie tray, it, it drops down just a touch. Um, it'll do that for margarine. It'll do that for American butter. Um, European butter, you won't see that puff in the middle as much. Um, where it comes out of the oven, it kind of stays there. You got more solids. Uh, yeah, you just have more fat, yeah. um, so you have less water and you end up with less of a, of a puffy leavening agent. Well, another question is, compared to margarine to butter, you know, they say margarine is better for you than butter, or some people say butter is better than right? margarine. Yeah, it just depends on what side of the... Of course, I'm from the farm, so I say butter is better for you. I, I think butter provides a, a, a better flavor. Your most expensive option usually to, to use, and um, yeah. a little bit more difficult to work with because it gets shelf soft life margarine is better. But, but if yeah. you've got cholesterol issues, margarine is better because it's uh, vegetable instead of animal based fat, so keeps your heart healthy. What about substituting an olive oil for a, a, a liquid fat for <laughs> such as like an egg? I don't know, a more of a savory application, oh. I would say. No, well, no, um, like um, we'll do olive oil. Bread or Quick bread or in a um, genoa, but if okay. you ever done that in a cookie or a brownie? Not yet. <laughs> Did you have a question over here? Yeah, so going off the whole cookie dough. All right. At work, um, someone made cookie dough and she did double the recipe. And we, we scoop all our cookies and freeze them and pull them out of the freezer to bake. I come into work and I bake 48 cookies. They're all super crispy, and the center was completely raw. So trying to save it, I tried to turn it into a cookie cake. The whole outside cooked, and the center was completely raw. What could she have forgotten that could make it? I've been trying to figure it out all week. Well, for, for one thing, it didn't bake long enough for the raw. Right. Yeah, my first guess would be oven temperature. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also the normal temperature that we, which we've been having issues with. That but so. yeah. big, big, big um, <laughs> difference between sometimes what the dial says on the outside and what's actually happening on the inside. And the flour. And, and, then, trying, yeah. and then sometimes ovens get very hot, and the glue that holds the part that shows where the dial is, and then uh, the part where the numbers are, sometimes gets off. Because I was working in a kitchen, and then one day my chef comes up to me. He's like, "I know we bake the creme brulee at 300, but today you're going to do it at 285 because the oven's broken." And then a week later, I do 285, and it's messed up. And then I touch the, the middle part, and it just like just spins around. Like like there's there's no consistency to it. And that's kind of true of all ovens. Every oven's got a sort of mind of its own. How many of you have a, a digital oven that you have it set on 350, and then you say, well, I'm going to turn the temperature up to say 400, and when you do so, it registers as 324. It wasn't even really close to 350 the whole time you were baking, so. It's difficult, and you need to learn your oven. I'm sure we all mm -hmm. have found instances. Yeah, where we deck number two adjustments. is not like deck number and four, and they're all yeah, the same right, temperature. Exactly, two ovens side by side can be yeah. oh. drastically different. Yeah, results. we. So I bake. We we here at the hotel bake approximately 400 cookies every day, up to a thousand. Is rarely do we go without baking any for the, you know, you come in, go to the front desk, and and you get a, a double tree cookie. By the so way, I've, that was really good. Uh, yes, I didn't of course. Get one. Uh, that's okay. Um, well, wow, we'll have that was even my offer. We'll, we'll have them down in, in the in the booth when the chocolate festival <laughs> opens, so so everyone gets a sample. Uh, but I've learned that uh, we've got we've got four ovens that we use, and the first one I can and everything I set for 350 in a high fan because these are convection ovens, so they've got fans in them that circulate the air faster, which uh, allows the cookies to stay. Um, in their shape, hold their shape a little better. So I, I learned that, that that first oven, terrific. Use that one, they'll come out perfect every time. The, the one under it, it's like, it, it's all right, it's not great, and the one next to that, about the same, but if you use that fourth one, your cookies are gonna take three times as long and be spread out. And when we're doing things like the cookie tins, they, they just won't fit, so we'll have to make sure that 
that it's we pulled the the ones from the correct oven to to put in the tins just because we've got that that factor. And some ovens, you know, um, depends on your oven. In a, in a general, even in a commercial oven, the ones that go on the hot line aren't necessarily the best for baking. Sometimes we have to use them, but um, you may turn them on to 325 and they actually heat up to 350 before they turn off and settle at 325 and then may drop down to 290 before they kick back on. And so um, you can, like uh, I've got my ovens at work where we've stabilized them, we've just gone to the um, hardware store and bought some um, fire brick. And that kind of creates a more consistent um, transition thing. They hold it allows the oven to work less. Yeah. It actually works at your house too. I mean, you if you put get, them on your bottom rack. Yeah, you just put them on your bottom rack, and it'll actually keep your. If you're doing pizzas at home, instead of buying the Pampered Chef little marbles, get fire brick, and then just lay the bottom layer of your oven with the fire brick. It'll actually extend the shelf life of your ovens. The industry, like the house, like if you have ovens at home, you lay that fire brick down in there, and it will extend the life of your your ovens at home. It doesn't have to work as hard. You put it on the rack. Right on the rack, on the bottom one, there, the fire bricks are like, like that. Yeah. yeah. But you can bake your pizza around the fire brick, too. Um, once it comes up to temp, it'll hold it. Now, during the winter time, you can make pizzas and do some bread and stuff. And then when you're done cooking, like you, it's already come out of the oven, just open the oven door and turn the oven off and turn your heat off in the house. And I mean, it's, it's going to have some heat. It'll hold the heat. Those fire bricks will hold some heat for a little while. It'll warm up the room. We never, I don't think, finished your cookie question. I, there's, we got, there's, there's 14 different things. My thing would be flour. I think the wrong flour or mixing method. Not enough flour. Incorporation of the ingredients. Do they taste normal? Um, yeah, it tasted pretty normal. Yeah, it's pretty. That and that's I say the same thing. And I've I seen my students other do stuff this. In the oven to make sure it wasn't just. And oven. everything else worked. Everything else worked. Top shelf, bottom shelf. So it's like wrinkled and funky looking on the outside, puffy in the middle, but raw. Yeah, I would say mixing method, even distribution. No? Like mixing method and not enough flour. Boily on the bottom, too, could be um, most of it, in, in, in my limited experience, kind of goes back to that creaming method, that step one. Over, over creamed. That is the most vital step. Um, and as these gentlemen said, it really is just knowing what you're looking for. Um, my advice to anybody who was struggling with that cookie recipe is just keep making it. Um, the more you do it, and pretty soon you're going to, it's gonna become second nature. Maybe in small you know batches till you get that, so you don't waste a bunch of ingredients. Well, it's also a difference of bakers, because there's two of us, so. Ooh, oh, yeah. And only one person does the mixing. These are frozen cookies? They freeze yeah, we make them frozen. Yeah. Try, did frozen. you try thawing it first? I tried. I've, you I've tried everything to. Everything I could think of, I tried. And how three. many portions? Um, my colleagues are left over. Still. Um, I threw the rest of it out because we couldn't Good. anything to do with it. We, Good. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 once, sell, so. four or five times a semester, I'll run into this. Um, and, and it's it's my chocolate chip. It, it even says in the book, Chef Blunt's chocolate chip cookies, and it's uh, it's, it's a very simple formula I've been making it for a long time um, it's it's butter it's sugar it's brown sugar it's creamed to a certain consistency um, it even says the five quart KitchenAid mixer with the white paddle <laughs> for this amount of time I mean it's very very specific and we use it for stage techniques and a stage is a tryout a, a trial a process for folks when they're trying to get a job um, and even at Aspire we still do that thing uh, th that stage the students that have been through our program have to come back and when they do the stage to get into Aspire they have to come right back to the chocolate chip cookie interestingly enough the ACF has now required that if you are a if you're going for CC, cert, um, CPC, Certified Pastry <laughs> Culinarian, it's no longer just two different cookies, two different methods. It is chocolate chip cookie, one dozen. So it tells you just how important Chef was saying about the creaming method. Even the ACF is now saying you have to know how to do the creaming method perfectly. 
it's it's a very specific process to even to get a certified as a certified pastry culinarian. It's that's like, it's like a two year basic step in this industry. So if they're now stating that it, it's it's a but it's 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 I think people take it too lightly because even my ten year old does it. A ten year old makes chocolate chip cookies. My eight year old helps. He doesn't do it, but he helps. He gets the ingredients and he hands them to Grayson. But Grayson is very OCD. <laughs> Carson couldn't do it. Carson's too busy watching the television while he's doing it. And I've already told him, you, Carson, you can't watch the television. Where'd he get that trait from? What? I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't ever watch the television while I'm scaling or while I'm mixing. Because that's the very first thing you tell somebody is you can't talk or communicate in any other methods while you're scaling or mixing because if you do so, you run the risk of improper scaling or improper mixing. Um, usually the, the silent SAMs are the ones that I stick in charge of the mixers in industries that I've, uh, when I've run bakeries or helped consult at bread facilities, I, the first thing I ask the owner is, who's your silent SAM? And they go, what? And I go, the, the, in, the introverted one. I need to know who the introvert is. And they go, why do you want to know who that is? That's the person I want running the mixer. Why? Because he's not going to talk. They can't talk while they're doing this process because of how important it is. Scaling, mixing, it's the key. Yeah, I would say we had edible vibe open. We would do the same batch cookies, freeze them. And they were great freezers or whatever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everything ripped open. You know, we're getting cookies, some great, some spread, you know, in the same thing. Yeah. And, and, and Take it for granted. And um, in, in going back and having to, you know, cost a lot of money to go through those ingredients. They're expensive, chocolate, nuts, all that stuff. Um, and Butter. we found it was just, um, for me, it was even incorporate, just even incorporation of ingredients, which means, you know, your chemical leaveners are getting sifted into your flours before they go in and not just dumped on top. In that creaming method, how long you're creaming it, but then also you have, you know, as you're, are you scraping your bowl down? That's you know, a big one. That bottom step. spot of the bowl and the sides at the top and where the paddle meets those and both those, there's always a different kind of um, mixture hanging on to that stuff. And so you got to have the patience just to knock that down a little bit and spin it, boom, mm -hmm. and go on to the next thing. And um, that just wasn't happening. It was kind of like, here's this formula. And you'd be surprised um, if we put out a simple formula in here and just said, hey, follow these directions, make this. I don't How cookies. many different oh. cookies we have. Oh. And it's just a cookie. Yeah. And that phrase right there, it's just a cookie. <laughs> no, it's well, not. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I no, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, I was just wondering, what is the most difficult part of trying to teach others I'm From still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, it's uh, for me. I I have a tendency to think of things a little bit differently. For example, how I do math is it, when I when I talk through uh, like multiplication, the people around me just like stare at me blankly. So the, the most difficult thing I've found so far is getting what's going on in my head and explaining it in a way that that everyone else can can understand. Because sometimes it's uh, I mean. Uh, Elena, who's, who's back there I work with, sometimes I, I just make noises and point, and she's like, I know what you're talking about. But then she has to translate for the other person who just stares at me blankly. So It's a lovely relationship. It, it really, yeah. it really, like, like the other day, there was some, we were, we were putting up, <laughs> we were putting up desserts, and, and she moved a tray before I had finished it, and I just started, like, like honking. I was like, eh, eh, don't do that. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> But uh, some, sometimes it's a matter of, of standing next to them and saying, this is exactly how you need to, to do this. And, and you stand next to them, and you do it while they're watching once. And then the next time, they do it while you're watching. And then if they get it right, you can feel comfortable letting them do it on, a, on their own. Which is why I always get nervous if, uh, if I'm off for a couple of days and they run out of something that, that I haven't trained anyone else on. And it's like... I hope this goes okay, and then it usually does. So. It, it's an awareness, too. When you go into the kitchen, it's, if, if your mentality is this is just a job and I'm counting hours down until I go, it's, it's not going to connect. Um, being in a kitchen, 
is um, being connected to that entire environment. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the physical temperature, humidity levels, all of that, your coworkers and peers and where they're at in their individual days and their moods and, um, and how everything is responding. Because it, it, as you're hearing us up here, it's not just the, the formula, it's, it's how does it smell, look, taste, feel, all those things. And when Chef Blum was talking about the folks that just like to talk, that you miss all that stuff. You, you, you forego all those opportunities to perceive and take in if you're filling the air with something that you need to say. Um, um, I get um, to go to Nashville and work with um, um, Victor Wooten, who's a musician, and um, his big thing is, you know, that the pause, the dramatic pause, the pause in music, the pause in a conversation, um, you know, it's the, the pause that makes music. Without that rest, there is no music. And it's the same way in life. If, if we're doing this all the time, we're, we're missing a lot. Um, and I think also to answer your question there, Allison, is too is understanding that you're making a connection with that person, and so you're looking for clues. And all people learn differently, so it is, whether you're a chef running a kitchen and you're responsible for everybody under your guidance to do things the same way. You have to, to understand that you're connecting with that person. And you can do that in a number of ways, too, by having them describe back to you what you just said. And I've also found that never give anybody more than three steps to anything. Uh, and regardless, I mean, if we work together, I would not give somebody more than three levels of instruction at one time. You just can't chew four. Most people can't. But as you get those levels of instruction, you, Chef, you gave me three. I should be thinking like a chess game in my mind. I've got these, and what are my next potential moves, which include the things he didn't say. How am I going to? I'm going to keep my station clean and clean this up after I do this mixing process, and what might be coming next. That's and why hey. Chef only gives you three, because <laughs> <laughs> you've got to figure out the other five. Yeah. <laughs> Except in European terms. Pardon? Except in European torts, when there's six recipes. Right. <laughs> True. Right. Well, sometimes one of those steps might be. Read this recipe. <laughs> Get back to me when you're done. Twice. Yeah. Right. Twice. I think it's always uh, one of our one of our directors at our school. Um, Bob always jokes and says, "Well, you just need to stay uh, one day ahead of the students." And I'm like, mm -hmm. "That's the old mentality of teaching. Is to stay just stay one day ahead of your students. That's not the way um, schooling is done now in culinary schools." It's just not done that way anymore. Um, I think there's a, a culture of, of um, education now that is, um, has been fostered through our educators that have taught the, the new age that's here now. Um, so it's those before us that have taught us and, and passion. Um, I think as a student, the dramatic pauses, the, the certain amount of steps, the communication levels, the, the well thought out game plan. Um, it's all those things, it's the complete package. Um, you, have to, you have to want to be there, I think. Is, is it something that you are thinking maybe down the road you want to do? You want to get an education? You gotta love it, and it's not about money <laughs> at all. Um, uh, it's a it's a long road to tow, and you'll you'll make money down the road, way down the road. But it'll fill your heart with a lot of great things if you really want to do it because you love it. And every thinking moment, you're kind of like always is done. Like it's two o'clock, I'm done, or class is <laughs> over, I'm done, or my shift's over. It's you know the people Next. that are really getting right. it um, are the ones that just think about it and tear it apart. And why does it work? And why doesn't it work? And how could I make this my own? And all that stuff. And that's why students, you know, questions are music to the chef's ears because that means you are engaged. That tells that person, the instructor, yeah. the, the chef, whoever, that you understand where you want, they want you ultimately to go, but you're trying to refine and make sure that you get there in the right step. So obviously we can't really tell when we tell you something that you understand mm -hmm. the process. Um, your questions then make sure that we're communicating uh, as we want to. I mean, you've been yes. trying to, yeah. Um, for each of you, who inspired you to do what you're doing? Uh, second question. question. If uh, from 
the home front, if you're making having a dinner party, and let's say for Chef Lauren, uh, you don't have time to make everything from scratch, but you want to have a really nice plate of dessert at the end. Um, which part of your component would you purchase versus making from scratch? That's a great question. That's a great question. It is a great question. That's you. You should, should I go with that first? Yeah. All right, let you guys think about this. That's I think. Um, <laughs> easy. So that's, that's a, a lot of times when, when we do large-scale banquets here, we do have to purchase. Like, I, I played it up, that cheesecake. We, we get in cases and cases of that same cheesecake. I would say you can, you can purchase the main part of it and then use your own creativity and, and flavors to, uh, uh, what's the word? Make, make that a little better and enhance. enhance. Yeah. Thank you. That, it was right there. Yeah. Um, so for example, with that, uh, that same cheesecake that I, I plated up earlier, I've got it on my banquet menu five times. And one of them, I've got um, balsamic macerated strawberries and like a, a palmier type cookie, which is a puff pastry with sugar rolled in it and then sliced and, and baked so it's really crispy and puffy. Um, I've got it with lemon curd and... Uh, and strawberry sauce maybe I've got it with raspberry red wine which which we've just done and, and that went over really well so so and then that's something that you can look at kind of the the rest of your your meal and you're saying well I'm having something really rich and heavy for for my my main course so maybe I should just go with with a little like sorbet and fresh fruit and you go to the store you get some terrific blood orange sorbet and and then uh, you, maybe maybe do like a fruit soup and, and grill some pineapple, puree that with a little sugar, pour it into a bowl, and then put the ice cream on, or the sorbet on top of it, and then you've got something that's more interesting and you didn't put a ridiculous amount of time into. Because remember, you just have to clean the house, <laughs> get iron, clean up, take, the, yeah. take yeah. the shower, and we have to always think about this stuff. Because mm -hmm. as chefs, you know we're not home very much. So now we have to clean up around the house a little bit, and... Mm -hmm. Come on, you, you throw house parties, right? Mine's puff pastry. I'm going to buy puff pastry. That's simple every time. Yeah. And pull it out of the fridge two days prior to using it because the pepper's firm and in the pot. So yeah, I'm just yeah. That is, if I go to the store, I might just grab two sheets out of the freezer at work and take it home. <laughs> it's a fridge benefit. It is a fridge benefit. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to worry about it. All those Yeah, exactly. What was, um, Tommy, let's start with you, um, inspiration to? Uh, without question, Julia Child. Um, when I grew up, I'm older than most of you here, um, you had four channels on TV, ABC, CBS, PB, um, whatever, and PBS. Um, and even as an eight-year-old, I'll never forget Julia Child, you can actually get this episode, trying to debone a duck. And she mangled that thing. Uh, she was laughing through the entire episode, and she basically uh, confessed that she really didn't have a lot of experience, and trust me, um, Deboning a duck is about as challenging a, an event as you'll ever encounter. And I thought as an eight-year-old, if she can do that on national television, then there's a place for me in the culinary arts field, and there was. Um, and I agree with everything these guys say. I think a lot of times you can take very um, nice ingredients that maybe a pound cake has been made, and then when we watched Chef Lauren earlier, <clears throat> building up those layers with something like that that you could have a great wow factor in something that you cheat a little bit on, but you, you pick your battles, you have to. I would uh, say for me, um, you know, my, my, I think my mother, for that cooking inspiration, but it was right there in the Julia Child, um, Graham Care, the Galloping Gourmet, <laughs> um, mm. and I think um, that um, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Simone Beck and Julia Child, it's like the first culinary book I read in high school, just from end to end, just love the thing. And it's still... Yeah. One of the greatest cookbooks ever conceived, um, both editions of Emmett. Um, of course, most of you have seen the movie, Julie and Julia. Julia and, yeah. Julie and Julia. And that's what she does. She goes through the book. But uh, for my money, if I could only have one set of cookbooks, I would be it. Inspiration, it's stuff like this. I love it when I get together with my colleagues um, and my students um, because I always learn something. Um, and if you have that sense that I'm, I just turned 48. I, I stepped into professional kitchens the week I turned 16. Worked my way through college, but never 
worked less than 60 hours a week in a kitchen at that time, and most of those were more like 80 mm -hmm. hours a week yeah. for that time. And I know, I, I get around some of these guys, and I'm like, gosh, I don't know anything. I know like this much of what there is to know out there. So there's always a, if, if you don't have that, that ego, that fear ego, where you're like, <laughs> you know, um, you can just go, man, I, what's that little trick again? How did you do that? There's, there's so much knowledge out there, you're just willing to kind of take it. I think we're all that way too. I think we all yeah. have are, it's we're kind of these closet. Um, you know, we don't feel like we have all the information because seriously, think of the culinary field. It's, it's not something massive. you could ever possess all that knowledge if you and just. It's probably always changing too. Yeah, sure, it is always changing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Scuffy so, and Harold McGee, uh, McGee yeah. did not agree. <laughs> they were not all the yeah. same information in those two books. Yeah, at all. Who was your inspiration? Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking back to it, and I've, I've loved desserts and cooking since I was like a little kid. I wrote a recipe for cookies because I liked eating cookies, and we didn't always have butter and chocolate in my house, so I used oil and cocoa powder because I wanted chocolate cookies, and I was like eight years old. But then when I, I got a little older, I really like science. Um, I always have. I'm surprised I didn't pursue that at all. If, if I were to do you something did, else. Just you did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, <laughs> if I were to, to do something else, I, I would, I'm still considering getting a degree in food science and, and then going for more, more research and development. But I used to watch the Food Network, and since I am a, a slightly different generation than these folks. Um, it's okay. Yep, yeah, I know you enjoy that it's one. Okay. Uh, well, this is, wow. yeah. This, I, if you could bring my walker up. <laughs> Okay. I'm sure we can find some wheelchairs. Like, oh. <laughs> um, I I would watch uh, watch Food Network, and I remember watching Unwrapped because I really like how um, factories work. Because that's what really fascinated me. I wanted to like make toys for a living, and then I would stick around for the next show, which was Good Eats, because Alton Brown knows everything, or at least gives yeah. the impression that he does. Now that I'm thinking he might not. No, he does. <laughs> no, he does. He's yeah. seriously he, a food, he's I like, totally a science like that's, food that's, I probably learned more from watching Good Eats than I did from culinary school and maybe my first like like four jobs combined. Because he, he explains stuff and then he uses like adorable diagrams and, and I, I've explained, like, like his, uh, one of my favorites is how he explains how to, how to serve like flank steak and it's, and he has like hoses tied together and he's like, well, you could cut it this way and you just end up with these long hoses, but if you cut it this way, you have all these little pieces and they just fall apart. So he's definitely- He does the exact trip. same thing for the creaming method. <laughs> yeah. You can YouTube video Alton Brown's creaming method and he actually explains it with the same cool nifty little There's diagrams. There's another great little YouTube, um, um, but I'll post it on my Facebook later on today. It's a little, cartoon that takes you through baking cookies and that whole cream method. It's great. There's great resources out there now. Yeah, you can Google and YouTube yeah. anything. My, my and believe it or not, we're kind of guilty. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. My husband asked me probably a couple weeks ago, because when we cook it at home, I usually do all the prep cook uh, cooking. I, I cut all the vegetables and then I leave and go sit down and he cooks dinner and then we eat dinner and I don't really have to do all the standing there cooking work, which is like You're a great thinking, setup. I'm thinking, right? Yeah, it's a great setup. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Who does and, the cleaning? Neither of us. We yeah. just let it all pile up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's usually, usually. You know, plate for plate. <laughs> um, wow. Hold on a second. You know, it's a, it's a pretty good joint effort. But he asked me the other day, because he was like, you think I could take like a, a basic culinary school class and, and learn some knife skills? And I was like, you could do that, or you could just watch Alton Brown's knife skills episode and then go with the four recipes that he has at the end of the episode that's like, want some practice? Make this. And it's like, like, soup or pot roast or something where you just, you know, you have to stand there and you have to cut like six onions and, and you gotta learn all the right way to way to actually do it. Makes sense. Yeah. How about you, Chef? Who was your inspiration? Uh, I had two stages in my life. Obviously my family was um, my grandfather, um, Pop, um, Guyton Algernon Benson. Um, yeah, I almost got that name. Um, thanks, Mom and Dad. Almost. Um, it's sticking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we called him Guy. But Ed Pop was, uh, he was a butcher um, and a farmer, and he was always in the kitchen uh, growing up in the summertime on the farm. Um, I was the only child. My mom and dad would send me in the summertime since I was out of school. I'd go hang out with Pop uh, in Live Oak, Florida, and it was all about going out and, and cooking dinner off the farm um, and grabbing 
food. And I think it's probably where it kind of got started, but I, it's not where I, I didn't want to be a chef. I just, I loved food, obviously. Um, uh, but um, I originally went to school for technical theater, the back of the house, building things, sets, designs, sculptural kind of stuff. Um, and then through necessity, um, right after the Christmas season, um, that world shuts down and I, I went to work uh, in the restaurant world because I could pay the bills. And I worked for a lady named Catherine Rabb um, while I was going to culinary school. And I could say that my culinary instructors were great, and they were. But looking back on it, Catherine Rabb um, was this, I guess, modern day Julia Child kind of lady that she turned her baseball cap around backwards and she owned this restaurant in Myers Park, Charlotte, called Catherine's on Providence. Um, high end restaurant, not, not fine dining, but high end bistro kind of setting. And it was always packed and it was always full, but Catherine was always on the line cooking. And it was always this wipe the rim of the plate. And I was just the salad kid. You know, making salads, making salads, making salads, making salads, you know. And, and she gave me a chance to bake. Um, and and um, she, she, I think she instilled work ethic in the industry. And, and Catherine really, really in, made me feel like, you know, this is, a, this is an industry. You, you look like you enjoy it. You look like you love it. And you're standing in front of all these customers because there's this huge glass wall. And you're, like, smiling while you're doing it still. <laughs> You're not sticking your finger in your nose. All you're doing is <laughs> But she was just, she was one of these people that owned a place, wanted people to grow. She would stop and teach you. And she still had 20 tickets hanging, and she still smiled. And, and I thought, wow, that's really incredible that there's somebody like that in the world. And um, I, I'd say a combination, two stages of my life, and a lot of other chefs down the road. Um, my adopted family here. In in, uh, in Roanoke is, I mean, ever since the very first email from from Chef Shop, so I kind of come here all the time and re-energize. This is my little re-energize home, so it's fun. So for it's, two days down in the in the in yeah, the AK in room. Cool basement, he's re-energizing by making dozens of chocolate sculptures. It's fun <laughs> on his time off, kind of. Speaking of chocolate sculptures, yeah. um, Jacques <coughs> Torres was. Is, like my hero, one of them. And I, I would watch just everything he did. And it, he, I determined one year that I was going to make one of a, a, a sculpture for Christmas. Mm -hmm. Well, and you said, I try to stay away from temporary chocolate as much as possible. Well, I, I guess I did it wrong because all my stuff stuck to the mold. And I can get it out, and it was the biggest mess that ever was, and that was the end of my trying to make chocolate sculptures. Mm -hmm. What happens? Why do you temper chocolate? I mean, Chef? does it change? That's a yeah. whole other yeah. hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, feel free to come and see me at the booth, though, okay. and I'll be happy to to talk you through some stuff. I'll even give you the website for Calibo, and there's a little we have Calibo Web TV. Um, and it does um, small little sculpture techniques for home um, that you can go through the process. And we even have um, uh, Calibo ambassadors online that you can stop and ask. And it's, it's great stuff. And yet, yeah, um, Chef Therese also does classes uh, up in his New York shop. Uh, it's in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, and he does uh, hands-on classes in the afternoon. And it's a phenomenal shop if you can get a chance to go up there and see the place. You can actually watch them making the chocolate right there inside of his shop. That um, Calibo website, I was watching oh. watching that before you came awesome. up here, so yeah. it looks look so much like a room. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got this great how to temper, step by step, mm -hmm. a couple of different methods. Um, yeah. there's, again, great, some great resources right there on YouTube Huge. and some of these, um, mm -hmm. some of the um, larger um, manufacturing companies. And they're doing it for you, and, and for chefs like Lauren in the industry, and then educators. Well, I, I've so it's different <coughs> levels. Done baking and chocolate and stuff with my nieces, nephews, grandchildren all at Christmas time every year. And and so I thought, well, it would be a great thing to teach them how to do if I could learn to do it myself. 
Well, and even some of it, though, I mean, you don't have to always do complete tempering with the kids. I don't temper chocolate with my kids at home. There are certain things I just know where if I was going to do something with nieces and nephews, I would keep it small, keep it simple. And some of those projects are on the Calibo Web TV as well. Um, we, we know where the cutoff is. There are certain things. Modeling chocolate's always fun to do with them. Um, at Tootsie Rolls. I tell mm. people to go to the store and buy the really big Tootsie Rolls and then just knead it with your hands and let the kids play with it like Play-Doh. Make sure they wash their hands ahead of time, but whatever they're done, then they can just eat it. It's fun. It's fun for the kids to play with, for, especially for little kids and nephews. I think we're uh, wrap up. Yeah, we have one left. I have a quick question. Uh, I've made Florentine cookies the mm -hmm. last couple times, and they, how do you keep them in a cookie? Just put them in a mold or? Can you put them on a sheet pan and not have them spread all over? Flexi pan, so they actually have Florentine molds out there. There's a flexi pan Florentine mold. That helps. One. Two, are you are you portion controlling them? A little I scoop? Tried. I okay. tried. I tried. Is the batter cold when you start? Uh, no. Cold. Yeah. Okay. Um, you realize you're you're not it should be spreadable. It's kind of like a bee sting mix yeah. kind of Florentine. Um, Flexi pan uh, is good because it'll hold. Silpat mats, clean ones. Make sure they haven't gone to the dark side. <laughs> Sorry, hot food people. Oh. Right. <laughs> we don't have too many of those. Huh? Yeah. They all went to dark. Uh, make sure they're the make sure they're the hidden sheet pans. Yes. Hidden sheet pans. Where do you have yours at? Uh, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> they well, they like, currently jealously guard their sheet pans because they send ones. them to the culinary side. If you pull any of those in that speed rack over there, they're going to be they all got little bends and dents. But but the good thing is they design these speed carts for bent sheet pans because if you try to put one of the perfect ones on there, they don't fit, they don't fit and they're going to get stuck. And then when you give it to one of the hot side folks and he's trying to yank it out and he spills his food, he, he gets really mad and it's like, you shouldn't be stealing my sheet pans. <laughs> like, you, you leave those for me and, and then we won't have this. You problem. guys are getting a real behind the scenes look at what actually goes on back there. Because at the Grove Park Inn, there is an old oven inside the bake shop that was just removed. And I spoke to Chef Todd Owens and I said, so you removed the old oven? And he said, yes. And I said, he goes, but there was something very interesting. And I started giggling on the phone and he goes, you knew about it, didn't you? I said, yeah, they didn't tell you. And he goes, dude, there was like like 40 or 50 sheet pans back then. <laughs> and I said, so he didn't tell you? And I, he goes, no. And I said, they're like brand spanking new, man. <laughs> and he goes, they were like, yeah. And I, he goes, and then they were removing the rotating rack oven. I said, yeah. And he goes, so there was a small sauce pot holding the chain that was keeping the rack moving. I said, yeah. He goes, and it was like a whole bunch of Schwinn bicycle wrapping or something. I was like, well, I had to replace the chain on the motor the night before Thanksgiving. And the only thing that was open was the Walmart. And they had bicycle chains. <laughs> he goes, well, there was sheet pans up there, too. And I went, you know, they were flat. So I was just trying to keep it flat. <laughs> so yeah, we hide things. We have to. So yeah. So. And the culinary guys don't care. They, they don't, no, they just, do not. no. No sympathy for the bake shop. No, no, no. we do certain they things. They need it, they grab it. Yeah. yeah especially in, in December here when, when things get really crazy and you realize the only sheet pans left available in the house are your really pretty flat ones that are, are way hidden in that in that closet back there. So it's like, all right, I'll get them out and use them, but that means I have to stand next to the dish machine and pull out all my fancy ones and make sure they get... Put back in but right I can place. tell you, having spent most of my time on the culinary side, we're probably more afraid of her than anybody mm -hmm. in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> um, of mice truth, or men, the be afraid of the mice. Pastry chefs have a way of staking out their territory, and you don't cross that line. Oh. Or, they get, oh, they hate me here. <laughs> <laughs> they keep it that way. But yeah, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I mean, they hate me so much that they're giving me a bake shop. So, <laughs> right. for you. we yeah, need to keep crazy room. in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> keep her away from us. No, but hopefully, there's a lot of different things. Flat sheet pans, silk pat mats, the Florentine molds is the most expensive route, but cool the batter Cold. down. Make sure the emulsification of the batter goes in. It's clean. Is there chunks of almond and pieces in it? Or is it just oh, a clear one? Oatmeal. oatmeal. Make sure all the oatmeal is the same cut. Um, no big clumps. 
That way it evenly spreads. Make sure you don't start off with a dome. Make sure you start off with a flat puck so it spreads even. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all those things. Um, you know, no hot spots in the oven. It's, it's, it's Florentines are always kind of a pain. So, but you can go at it from there. Yeah, Your last one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I'm also trying to do bacon and pastry just so I'm like well rounded. Smart. And um, it's kind of hard for me to think outside of chocolate and peanut butter. So, do you guys have any advice for how to get inspiration outside of chocolate, peanut butter, and cheesecake? No, you're there. You're All in the right. South. You're there. So, <laughs> Key Lime? <laughs> yeah. Uh, she is in the South, right? Uh, Those are the things that yeah, sell. What's she missing? Yeah. Carrot cake and red Pecan velvet, pie. right? Uh, balsamic macerated strawberries. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> not, yeah. you just add that to it. Yeah, I, like, I like the Italian apple part apple of New Jersey. Yeah. Right, exactly. Do you do you use Pinterest? Yeah. Of course you do. Look at every dessert on Pinterest. That is a Damn. ridiculously good resource. But I put have a timer like, in front of you. Yeah. You don't don't yeah. spend too long. Yeah, I have yes. I have like three or four other pastry chefs who I know I've never met. I just really like their plated dessert pins, and I've gotten all sorts of crazy inspiration from that. And and even if if you get an idea, like I I did the chocolate peanut butter one the other day. I was like, I want a chocolate peanut butter dessert, and I just typed it into Pinterest, and it, there were like a million ideas. And I didn't use one specifically, but I just kind of mix and match and put them together. Yeah, and don't worry about the recipes. You don't need the recipes. Mm -hmm. By the time you're done with culinary school, you won't need recipes, off the internet. I call it food porn. It's just pictures. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time with my students. It's just pictures. Just look at the pictures and move on. Take the pictures of the stuff. Use it as inspiration. When you come into the ballroom today, there's pictures laying around the sculptures that I have. And I'm leaving them out there. They're inspirational pictures. You'll see where these sculptures and flower ideas came from. I'm, I'm not beyond saying that I go out and get Pinterest. I, I don't have Pinterest. Yes. Uh, Facebook. Yeah. At Facebook. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll 2,000, my pins to Facebook. 2,500 friends. <laughs> Lots of pastry people. 1,500 of them are from Europe or Japan, and they're all pastry chefs. So all of their photo posts of their centerpieces and their, and you just get ideas. So just stay, just that whole short stay circuit aware. number five. Stay aware. Info number five, number five, info, info. Just keep taking in as much, sponge it up, enjoy it. It'll come, but it's good for you that you're well-rounded, that whole getting both, because most people don't. Give you an edge. Oh, yeah. First job as a pastry cook, you're going to be making salads anyway. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the line. <laughs> That's the pantry job. That's yeah. where I started, right, with Catherine? Yeah. Who else had the pantry job first? Did you grocery pantry? store bakery. Oh, well, what was in the job description? The rotisserie chicken? No, no, the, the deli was across the way. I got to just They never it. had, to, like, in know, I No? I no? Wow, you were yeah. lucky. I've, I've, I'm North Carolina, the baker, the cake decorator's third job description is changing out the rotisserie chicken, so. Yeah, I've, I've been lucky where I've, I've had to do very little actual hot, hot food. Yeah, very animal little animal flesh. flesh and hot food, just, which makes it, me enjoy it more when I go home. There you go. Awesome. I have a question that's a little off the wall, but I've heard an old wives' tale that you cannot make meringue in an electrical storm. Do any of you Whoa. have experience? Wow. <laughs> We're going to try it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Electrical <laughs> storm ring. I mean, I won't peak. I, I don't they, know if it's true it's, or not, but I've heard that. Chef, I need a kite and a <laughs> key. <laughs> we'll try that in the lab. Frankenstein. That's cool. Guys, we need to, I think, move on. We've got another great uh, great presenter um, coming in, Stacy Nolan. She's and awesome. She's awesome. Check her shoes out. <laughs> 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 <laughs>